everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here. Normally my colleague Marie comes and uh, visits with everyone here, but since she's uh, out of the country, I, I got to come this time. I recognize many of your faces, um, but uh, as was noted by my colleague, I hope you don't mind uh, saying your name and outlet uh, before you ask a question, just so I can know where you're coming from and get to know you as well. I thought I would just start off, I know many of you know this, but just give you a brief update on uh, where the secretary is. Uh, he is on his way to Amman, Jordan right now. He should be landing soon. Uh, this was a uh, additional stop that we just added over the past couple of days, given the tensions on the ground uh, in Israel. And he'll be meeting there with uh, King Abdullah. Uh, he'll also be meeting with President Abbas. Uh, we're, of course, uh, the schedule is still coming together, so if we have uh, more on that, we'll make that available to all of you. And as you know, uh, he just was in China with President Obama. Uh, they just concluded the trip yesterday. It was a very successful uh, bilateral visit there. Uh, they announced a range of steps, including confidence-building measures, uh, <laughs> including uh, a climate change uh, goals, uh, which is a big priority of the Secretary, something he's been working on closely with the Chinese for the last year and a half since he came uh, into office. Uh, and with that, why don't we start with questions? Would you like to start? You have great pink lipstick on, so we thought we'd start with you. Go ahead. <clears throat> acceptable solution, does the U.S. plan any particular approach, any concrete steps to this issue to be resolved since it has importance for the stability and security in the country? Well, thank you for your question. I actually thought I would get this question earlier at the State <laughs> Department. Uh, as you noted, uh, this uh, there were meetings and there are discussions that are ongoing. We continue to support the ongoing United Nations-led talks on the Macedonia name issue and the resolution of this long-standing disagreement is something that we would like to see as soon as possible. We hope that the leaders of Macedonia and Greece will find a mutually agreeable solution to the name dispute as soon as possible in the interest of Euro-Atlantic uh, integration, economic prosperity, peace, and security in the region. Uh, obviously, this is something that the discussions are ongoing on, so our role is certainly supporting that and, and encouraging a, a resolution of that. Uh, why don't we go to the back? We'll just mix it up here. Go ahead, right? Blue tie, go ahead. Once I know everyone's names, I will be much better, but go ahead. Just get in the mic. And uh, I represent RTVI, it's a Russian language channel here in the United States. Hello, Ro Roman is your name? Roman, yeah. Roman, nice So to meet you. I, I guess you already answered this question earlier in State Department, but uh, can, you be, uh, can you give us more details about your position uh, about last news about Ukraine? Because today the general uh, Breedlove told about the officially confirmed uh, the Russian equipment in Russia, and what about consequences from the United States for Russian invasion or how you call it? Well, uh, let me first say, and I mentioned this earlier, but uh, Secretary Kerry spoke with Foreign Minister Lavrov today as well. They spoke about the situation in Ukraine, and Secretary Kerry uh, certainly reiterated uh, our concerns and our uh, belief uh, that all sides should abide by uh, the Minsk protocols. We've obviously seen, as General Breedlove spoke to, as the OSCE has spoken to, uh, what are we perceive as some violations of the Minsk protocol. But this is an ongoing dialogue. We still feel that is is a good basis for a diplomatic resolution of the situation uh, there. Uh, I don't know if I addressed all your questions. Do you have another so one? No emergency I'm breaking our own rule here, but go ahead. <laughs> no emergency response from, like... Well, I will say thank you for reminding me of the second part of your question. Uh, 
We have, as you know, uh, because you cover these issues closely, as do a number of your colleagues I recognize in the front here, uh, we have put in place um, consequences in the form of economic sanctions, as have a number of our European counterparts. That is not our preference. What we'd like to see is a resolution of what's happening in Ukraine. But that's going to require abiding by the Minsk protocols, and several of the steps that we've seen lately uh, certainly uh, are not abiding by the protocols. So we are in touch with our European partners. Um, we have long said that uh, we would be prepared to broaden and deepen the existing sanctions uh, should the circumstances on the ground warrant that type of action. Go ahead. I recognize you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jen, and uh, thank you for coming over. And thanks to our friends at the FPC for hosting this, as usual. And uh, since this is your debut, I, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about yourself. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, you, okay. you, uh, you, you are a big celebrity in Russia, as, as you probably know, as you probably have heard. So what do you think about that? And uh, uh, I must say that uh, the... Uh, uh, <laughs> the perception there is not always kind. Uh, people uh, tend to believe that you are either uh, misinformed or misrepresent the facts. So I, I wanted to ask you about uh, the uh, Russian position in the dispute over Ukraine and uh, how closely you uh, monitor, you ha ha how uh, well do you know you think the Russian position? For instance, there was recently a big speech by President Putin in Sochi uh, about these issues. Uh, so uh, have you read the speech by the, uh, uh, personally? And, and, and in general, uh, how is the input from the Russian side on that taken into account? Or, and is it? Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, well, first, let me say that contrary to some the belief of some, I think Russia is a wonderful country with wonderful people who have a great culture and history. Anna Karenina is one of my favorite books. I know that's only a small sliver, but um, I just and I have uh, had we had a wonderful visit to Moscow just a year and a half ago. I accompanied the secretary on. Uh, we have a disagreement about the United States and, and Russia, I should say, have a disagreement uh, about Ukraine. Uh, we work on a number of other issues together. We were, we're working right now on the P5 plus 1 negotiations. And the, the strength of a relationship is sometimes the ability to talk about issues where you disagree and also talk about issues where you agree. And the Secretary's uh, call with Foreign Minister Lavrov this morning is a good example of that. They talked about the P5 plus 1 negotiations. Uh, where we're working closely in lockstep with Russia uh, to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. But they also talked about Ukraine and our concerns about uh, reports and, and, and uh, not just reports, but statements by our uh, colleagues at the OSCE and at NATO about violations of the Minsk Protocol. So I am fully aware that uh, the uh, propaganda machine uh, attacks against me uh, increased uh, when the uh, circumstances and the, the situation on the ground in Ukraine became more challenging. Uh, I can look at news reports and look at history and know that. And I know that I'm out there uh, representing the United States government and what our position and what our views are. Uh, but uh, I think there's a misunderstanding of, uh, or sometimes a um, categorizing or quantifying uh, a disagreement about the position of the United States with a, a misunderstanding on my part of what our position is or what the situation is. The two are, are totally different things. Have you read the speech? Have I read President Putin's recent speech? I've certainly seen the news reports. I have not yet read the speech. Go ahead. I know you, you look very familiar. <laughs> yes, you come to, to the briefing with, at the State Department. Yes, yes, Good I do. And thanks for answering the questions. Uh, I'm with RT, mm -hmm. Russia Today. Uh, last week you said you have no independent confirmation of Russian troops uh, crossing Ukrainian border. Uh, I understand that, that General Breedloff is, is NATO, but do you have that confirmation now from coming from the U.S.? Well, th I don't have any new information from the United States government. As you know, because you follow this closely, the OSCE, uh, as well as NATO, are very cl closely watching what's happening on the ground. We work closely with them. We have no reason to question uh, their information. I don't have anything new from the United States government. But oftentimes there are other organizations who have more up-to-date information than we do. At least Is that can be shared publicly, I should say. 
is is there any 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 footage any any photos anything that the public can see that could confirm that well, uh, NATO and the OSCE have both spoken to this, and General Breedlove uh, certainly would not speak to uh, concerns about the actions of, uh, of Russian-backed separatists if there wasn't a backup for that at NATO. No information, nothing, nothing to, to show the public what backs that up. Well, oftentimes there's information that we have independently or information that we have through a range of sources uh, that uh, we try to make available to the public as soon as we, we can. And we've done that over the course of the situation in Ukraine on several occasions. But uh, NATO has on many occasions made information available, and I'd certainly point you to them given that they have uh, made all of the comments. Uh, go ahead in the front. Thank you. My name is Stefan Grober. I'm with Euronews uh, in Washington. Excellent. Nice I to meet you, Stefan. tend to believe that you're extremely popular in Europe. Um, popular in the same let way me, or in a different way? No, no. <laughs> the European way. Okay. Um, following up on this, uh, you mentioned, briefly mentioned uh, sanctions. Now, yesterday, uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel mm -hmm. um, uh, said that new sanctions are not being planned right now. What is your position on this? And um, would the United States be uh, ready um, to go alone if the Europeans uh, don't want to follow you on Sure. This? Uh, thank you for that. This is a really important question, actually, because there's been some uh, misunderstanding of this a little bit. Um, we have already put in place a range of executive orders that allow us to add new people and new entities to the sanctions list. The same is true in Europe, uh, as the laws, they call it slightly something different, but it's similar there. We are continuing to discuss right now uh, with Europe, uh, our European counterparts, um, our, uh, whether we would jointly impose um, any additional actions. Obviously, it's the belief of not just the United States but the EU that the preference would certainly be for uh, Russia and the Russian-backed separatists to abide by the Minsk protocols, to take steps. Uh, you know the steps, uh, but releasing prisoners, uh, moving back, um, from uh, from Ukraine, uh, moving back from the border, um, et cetera. Um, we, that's our preference that they take those steps. But, you know, the fact is it's, uh, it's, it's possible to add entities and people and names uh, to the existing laws. Uh, and that's my understanding of what was meant uh, by that. As you know, we have at times, we've been uh, working and implementing putting out sanctions in lockstep with the EU, they haven't been exact, exactly the same. Um, and that's been the case, even though they've been very complementary. So there are certain steps that could be taken um, on, on either side, but we're still in discussions about that at this point in time. Uh, go ahead. Oh, right, right oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Fine, how are you? Great. Yeah, Wenxian from People's Daily, and uh, nice to meet you, James. Nice to meet you, too. And I must say that and, uh, you are more and more popular in your Chinese way. Oh. <laughs> 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 As you mentioned, that the, uh, the President Obama just uh, wrapped up his visit to China. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you please and, uh, talk a little bit more in a more detailed way? What's your comment on this? Thank you. Sure, I, I would love to, and I appreciate your question. And President Xi, as you know, they did a joint press conference um, where they both spoke about the visit, which was a very successful visit. And I think uh, the feeling uh, was that it was very successful from both sides. Um, we also recently, and I'll get to your question, but I thought I'd mention this too, uh, hosted um, State Councilor Yang Ji Chur in uh, Boston just a couple of weeks ago. And I had the pleasure of uh, participating in those meetings. Um, and that was a very productive uh, conversation and discussion. And I think the conversations between the secretary and the state councilor uh, helped lock in some of the um, announcements that were made by the two presidents over the last 24 hours. Uh, but just to touch on a couple of points, and then I'd love to talk a little bit about the climate piece, because I think that's a particularly important announcement that was made. Um, the, the meetings resulted in not only uh, a U.S.-China China, US -China joint announcement on climate change, but also an agreement on the expansion of uh, the ITA, which we feel is a very important um, negotiation that can now proceed for both sides on the economic front. Uh, as well as an agreement on military-to-military -military confidence building mechanisms to increase transparency and predictability and to reduce risk of unplanned encounters. Now, I, of course, have to say that 
it doesn't mean that we agree with China on every issue. And I think the leaders of China would say that too. And there was a discussion about areas where we've had concerns, um, whether that's human rights issues, which come up in any discussion, and a range of other topics. But let me talk a little bit about, uh, and one last thing to note, there was also an agreement on um, reci uh, reciprocal visa requirements. And the Secretary actually was able to um, to hand uh, the first 10-year validity visas to a group of Chinese business people and five-year validity visas to students at the U.S. Embassy in uh, Beijing, which was really, I think, a, a great event. Um, but on the climate front, uh, the two leaders uh, jointly announced the two countries' respective post-2020 climate targets. Um, now, why is this important? Uh, it's important because the United States and China are the world's two biggest economies, two biggest emitters of carbon pollution. A year and a half ago, we started the climate working group. Uh, we continued that discussion over the course of the last uh, year and a half. Uh, the focus of the lunch the Secretary had in Boston was on this issue. Um, they put in place ambitious targets uh, that we believe will uh, serve as um, kind of a, a leading um, uh, leading message to many other global economies as we lead up to the Paris negotiations uh, next year. So it was a successful trip. The secretary was just there a couple days ago for the ministerial level meetings, uh, and I, I know they just concluded yesterday. But go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm also from China. Hello. Yang. Hello. With China News Service. Um, during the visit to China, President Obama once said. Uh, he has an opportunity to explain his pivot to Asia strategy to Chinese leaders. But why you uh, explain quite a lot of times to Chinese counterparts, but why uh, media always say you, you have another you know, purpose on this? So what's your comments on that? Thank you. Sure. Uh, well, I appreciate the question. I will say the secretary also has been talking quite a bit about our, China, our Asia rebalance and what it means and uh, why it's so important. Um, you know, we all, uh, and let me talk specifically about our relationship with China just for a second, because I think the Secretary gave a speech about a week ago where he talked about this. And he talked about the fact that, you know, 10 years ago we were working together on bilateral issues. Now we're working together on a number of global issues, whether it's climate, climate change, whether it's Ebola or ISIL. Um, the fact is there are a range of uh, crises in the world at any given moment in time. And we can work with, and we work with um, a range of countries, Russia, China, other members of the uh, permanent UN Security Council members on those issues. But the Asia rebalance is about um, a focus on our relationship and the investment in our relationship for the future because we know that our economic uh, and our, our economic goals are tied, our security goals are tied, and we see great opportunity in Asia uh, for the United States, uh, not just China, certainly Japan, certainly South Korea. I don't want to not list any countries, but uh, all of Asia is the focus of our Asia rebalance. Uh, and the reason we explain this so frequently is because sometimes there's a view that when we're focused on a crisis in the world like ISIL and taking on the threat that ISIL poses as a terrorist organization, we're taking our eyes off the ball of our strategic objectives like the Asia rebalance, and that's incorrect. We can do both. We can walk and chew gum at the same time, and we have remained focused on the Asia rebalance uh, since the beginning of this president's administration. Uh, go ahead. Hi, I'm Nick O'Malley from Fairfax Media in Australia. I wanted to go back to the climate announcement. Mm -hmm. uh, given the significance of that announcement, would uh, do you believe America will be using the G20 talks to try and encourage other friends and allies, including Australia, to increase their commitments on curbing emissions? And secondly, could you comment on the surprise arrival of Russian warships off the coast of Australia as the G20 talks begin? Uh, sure. Well, let me take the first question. Um, climate um, and our pursuit of... Um, uh, achievable but um, but um, but challenging targets um, is something that the secretary raises in nearly every meeting and conversation he has. And the president of the United States has indicated that uh, this is also a big priority of his. Obviously, the G20, uh, there'll be, it's focused, as you know, on uh, economic issues and kind of how we're coordinating with the global economy. Climate, in our view, is part of that. Um, I'm not saying necessarily the agenda, but in general, the broad umbrella. And, but I am certain that in bilateral meetings that the issue of climate uh, 
as we look to the Paris negotiations uh, uh, in a year from now, will be a part of the agenda. Uh, in terms of reports about um, about Russian warships off the arriving in Australia, I don't have any confirmation of that, so I don't have any specific comment on it. Uh, Elliot, hello. Thanks, Jen. Um, Elliot Waldman with Tokyo Broadcasting System. Uh, I wanted to ask, staying on China, I wanted to ask, uh, during his press conference with uh, President Obama, uh, President Xi came down rather hard on the New York Times' Mark Landler um, in response to a question on the restrictive environment for journalists in China, particularly with regard to uh, non-renewal of visas for journalists and, and that kind of issues. So I was wondering, uh, as someone who frequently speaks out on press freedom, what your response to that was and how the U.S. government um, took those remarks. Thank you. Sure. Well, um, you know, the issue was raised by New York Times reporter because the New York Times has been impacted by this, as have other uh, outlets uh, in the United States. Um, you know, this is an issue, and I referenced in, in response to this gentleman's question in the front, where we have disagreements on. Obviously, media freedoms, the ability for um, reporters and outlets, whether they're from the United States or other countries, to uh, work and function in foreign countries is something we think is vitally important. Uh, but uh, we express that privately. Uh, we express that publicly in terms of our views about media being able to operate freely. We've raised some of these cases uh, as well uh, during conversations with the Chinese uh, over the course of the last year or so, as this has been a, a vital issue. Uh, and I think, you know, obviously we have a disagreement on that. Uh, it doesn't mean that we expected that every disagreement would be addressed at the conclusion of this, uh, this set of meetings over the po course of the past couple of days, of course. Go ahead. Mohammed Al Minshawi, I write for Egypt's Daily Ashrouk. Would you please update us about the military aid to Egypt? Does the Egyptian receive the Apache? And what about the rest, the F 16 and other material? And do you think the Republican controlled Senate will push the White House in a different direction regarding the military aid to Egypt? Uh, well, thank you for your question. Um, let me take the second question first, if that's okay, and I'll come around to the first. Uh, there's been a long history in the United States of cooperation on foreign policy issues uh, in a, on a bipartisan basis. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, that there aren't debates about issue. That's issues. That's the wonderful thing about democracy in the United States. But there has been cooperation on foreign policy issues, and we certainly hope and expect that will continue. Uh, and that relates to our security relationship with Egypt. Uh, there are Democrats and there are Republicans who feel that that is vitally important. The reason that we had uh, released the Apaches, a and now it's not a couple of weeks, it's probably months now ago, uh, time is sort of going going slowly, I suppose, um, was because of the risks that we saw in the Sinai and the concerns we had for Egypt's security and the fact that we knew uh, that that was something that could be useful. So yes, those have been uh, those have been released. In terms of their specific arrival or where they're being used, I, I would uh, certainly refer you to the Egyptian government for that. Um, in terms of additional military assistance, I don't have any particular new update. Uh, obviously, there are some certifications that uh, we have not certified at this point in time, um, given the fact that we still believe additional reforms need to be made. But we have uh, still, the Apaches are a good example, provided a range of security assistance given our desire to continue the security partnership with Egypt. Uh, go ahead. Manar Ghunim, Middle East News Agency, Egypt. Hello, how are you? Fine. Uh, again, uh, concerning Egypt, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, the Egyptian president ha announced this week that the parliamentary elections will be held within the first quarter of uh, next year. So how do you see such a move within the Egypt's uh, transition? And if you have a comment on the outcome of Ambassador Thorne, uh, uh, talks in Cairo this week. Thank you. Uh, well, certainly we feel moving forward with parliamentary elections is a positive step. Uh, we have consistently expressed our deep and ongoing concern about the deteriorating climate for freedom of assembly, association, and expression in Egypt. Uh, we continue to raise those concerns, and we certainly urge the Egyptian government to uh, take those concerns into account. Um, you know, from the beginning, uh, if we dial, look back a year and a half ago, uh, we've long encouraged steps 
the Egyptian leaders to take steps uh, to put in place elections, and, and this is a part of that process. But uh, obviously our concerns about freedom of assemblies, freedom of speech, media freedoms uh, play into how any uh, course of elections take place, so we'll have to see how that goes. Oh, Ambassador Thorne's talks. Uh, well, Ambassador Thorne um, led a, I believe the, the meeting concluded, or the uh, delegation concluded their trip, I should say, uh, just yesterday to discuss U.S. investment in Egypt. Uh, this was a, a desire on our part to um, help promote international investment, investment from the United States. Uh, we know that addressing the challenges in Egypt's economy will help Egypt prosper over the long term, and so that's the reason why we led a delegation there. I haven't had an opportunity to have a, a readout from the ambassador, but I know uh, there were some uh, readouts and updates on the ground. Sure. Uh, go ahead. Hello. do Estado de São Paulo. Hello. Hi. Uh, on the sidelines of the G20, there will be a meeting between President Obama and President Dilma Rousseff. Mm -hmm. What can we expect from the U.S. side, and how would you describe the current situation of U.S.-Brazil relations? Thank you. Well, I can uh, convey that I've discussed this with Secretary Kerry, and he very much feels that with the recent election uh, in Brazil, uh, that he's hopeful we can uh, really move the relationship forward. Um, we've had some disagreements over the past year or so. There's no secret about that. Uh, but Brazil remains an important partner. Uh, he's hopeful to become more engaged, uh, more and more engaged uh, in our relationship there. And certainly I expect that uh, when there's a, a meeting at the G20, they'll discuss the relationship moving forward. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Jessica Murphy, Canada Sun Media. I, um, first off, on the climate deal, um, there was, you know, the press release said it hoped to inject momentum into that coming climate treaty in Paris. I wonder if that means uh, increasing pressure on countries like Canada that had similar targets to the U.S. at 17 percent below 2005 by 2020 to ramp up their efforts as well. First off, and just secondly, on the uh, lawsuit filed uh, to the State Department regarding the Enbridge Alberta Clipper pipeline. I'm wondering if that may slow down that process as well. Sure. Um, on the first question, I think, as you know, the goal with the Paris meetings is to achieve um, a, uh, a a kind of universal is not the right term, but a a uh, a goal that that all countries can abide by or pursue. And so these are setting targets to hopefully, yes, set momentum, show that the two largest emitters, not Canada, the United States and China, are setting these ambitious targets and setting an example for that. Um, so part of the um, objective is to achieve this um, two degrees Celsius, Celsius global temperature goal. I expect that this will be part of the discussion uh, when the Secretary, when President Obama, when others in the administration meet with uh, a range of officials around the world because we've put down uh, aggressive uh, measures or aggressive goals and targets and, and we hope that uh, you know, we can all uh, rise to the occasion and really the challenges, the challenge that we have as a global community as it relates to the threat of climate change. Okay. Yes. The lawsuit regarding the Alberta Clipper. If that will slow down which piece? The process at the level of the State Department, you guys okayed the expansion, if I'm not, if, mm -hmm. but if that may cause a hindrance, any hurdles, any so on with that process or? No, not that I have, uh, I've heard from our team. Uh, oh, do we have, sorry, one? Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um, there's, um, I have a question about, um, first of all, Gilbert Ayuzgur from uh, Turkish news channel Habar Turk. Uh, U.S. sailors were actually attacked uh, earlier today in Turkey, and um, it was it is said to be a retaliation to um, 2003 event in Iraq. Uh, similar incident was actually the bags were placed on Turkish um, soldiers. Um, do you think this will uh, affect uh, Turkish-U.S. relations that are already uh, kind of strained? You know, it's you, 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 you seem to have uh, quite disagreements lately with Turkey regarding the um, ISIL. 
Well, let me first say that we don't actually see it as having disagreements with Turkey. They are an important partner. Uh, they're working closely with us as a part of the coalition efforts to defeat and degrade uh, ISIL. Uh, they've taken a range of steps uh, many of you are familiar with, including allowing uh, the Peshmerga to travel through and help fight uh, ISIL in Kobani, including cracking down on foreign fighters and doing more to crack down on oil smuggling, including doing more to speak out uh, against uh, ISIL. Uh, Turkey remains an important partner, an important NATO ally. With this specific incident, we're certainly deeply troubled uh, by the assault against soldiers of the USS Ross in Islamabad or in Istanbul. Sorry about that, Istanbul. The USS Ross uh, is visiting Istanbul uh, as a sign of uh, the longstanding cooperation and friendship between the U.S. and Turkey. But I will note that we've been working closely with the Turkish authorities since this incident happened. Uh, they have uh, made a number of arrests, is my understanding, and we are very uh, we're working closely with them and, and pleased with uh, their response to uh, to this incident. Go ahead. Change between um, um, secretaries, or is it any any meeting from the U.S. Uh, side to Turkey? Well, as you in know, future, our new the... ambassador, uh, John Bass, uh, just uh, landed there a couple of weeks ago. Um, he certainly is in close touch with authorities on the ground. Uh, General Allen, who is leading the coalition efforts, has been there at least once, maybe more than once, and, I'm, and he has been in close touch with authorities. And the secretary speaks regularly with his counterpart, Foreign Minister Chavasholu. Uh, he also speaks, given his uh, past friendship with, for, with uh, the Prime Minister Davatolu. And so I expect those conversations and dialogue will continue. But our authorities on the ground are in touch with, uh, with uh, people from our team on the ground. Uh, Yonam News Agency. Uh, this is part of the question that I asked you last week. Um, uh, you put out a statement last week that uh, former ambassador to Korea, Song Kim, uh, mm -hmm. has been named to uh, uh, succeed Ambassador Glyn Davis as yes. special representative for North Korea policy. But in, in addition to this important position, he was also named to uh, double as amb uh, deputy ambassador, uh, deputy assistant secretary, secretary for Korea and Japan. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering why he was ordered to assume these two important roles at the, at the same time, if it means uh, the, you believe that the, the position of special representative for North Korea policy is less important now, or if you know, Ambassador Kim is more capable than Ambassador Davis, thank you. <laughs> so your, your journalist colleagues are, are chuckling in the front and around you. Uh, understand your question. Uh, I will say that um, you know he is somebody who came from a uh, extensive and impressive uh, experience. Um, he is going to be applying as, as just recently the ambassador to South Korea, applying those skills to uh, his positions. It certainly doesn't change. Uh, the level of importance we place uh, on either of these positions. Uh, it just means that he's uh, very capable and he's someone with a great level of experience, and I think that speaks to how much importance we, we place in these positions. Uh, go ahead in the middle. Rahim Fukara from Al Jazeera. The, what exactly is the end game for the Obama administration with regard to Iran? Is it just a nuclear agreement or is there perhaps some thought that Iran could go to play the role that it used to play before Jimmy Carter and the advent of the Islamic Republic in the region? If I may do one more, when Lindsey Graham and John McCain went to Egypt over a year ago, they described what had happened there as a coup. Now that you have a, a Republican-dominated uh, Congress, is the policy uh, of the administration on Egypt likely to change either way, whether in, uh, towards what uh, Graham and McCain described or otherwise? Thank you. Sure. Uh, well, let me take your second question first. Um, I think it's important to note that we haven't been abiding by uh, our legal restrictions, uh, even regardless of the fact that we didn't, we made a determination we were not going to uh, place a label. Uh, so legal restrictions we've already put in place, and that is evidenced by the, um, the funding that we have held back at times in order to make certain certifications. Uh, so I don't anticipate a change in that. Obviously, um, you can't always predict what Congress may do, but, but certainly we all value um, Democrats, Republicans, the administration, Congress, uh, the security relationship we have with Egypt, and I think there are some shared concerns about 
uh, progress or more progress that needs to be made as it re relates to uh, other reforms. Uh, uh, on Iran, um, our objective, our focus, we have blinders on, is on the nuclear negotiations. Uh, as you know, the deadline is about a week and a half away. Uh, oftentimes in any negotiation, the toughest decisions are made, the most pivotal moments happen in the final days, and we certainly anticipate that being the case here. Uh, there have been some reports that uh, there was a desire to link or expand our uh, relationship. Uh, that is not the case. Our focus is on the nuclear negotiations and our concerns about um, issues like Iran state sponsorship of terrorism, about their human rights record, have not changed. Uh, but we do feel that preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon and working with uh, many counterparts around the world, from China, from Russia, from France, the EU, the UK, Germany, is, uh, is a, a vital uh, objective and foreign policy goal and, and one that it certainly makes sense that we have blinders on as it relates to trying to achieve it. Go ahead in the back. My name is Munir Mouari. I represent uh, Al Arab Al Jadid, based in London, Daily News. And uh, my question is rela related to what uh, Rahim said uh, about Iran. Uh, as follow up, the State Department announced today that Secretary of State is going to be in Abu Dhabi, I believe, on Friday uh, to attend forum over there. Is he? going to meet with uh, any Iranian participant, uh, government or non-government over there. Uh, and also, another question regarding Yemen. You have just uh, uh, announced uh, the freeze of the asset of the former president and uh, two leaders of the, the Houthis uh, movement. But uh, we don't know why the U.S. and the Security Council avoided the head of the movement uh, and you chose lower uh, leaders. Uh, is, is that because uh, of the negotiation with Iran? Is there any relation between what's going on in Yemen? And for the former president, did you find any uh, asset for him in the U.S.? Are you going to announce what he has or um, it's going to be secret? Uh, well, uh, to answer your question, is there any link between the sanctions in Yemen and who they were put on and the negotiations with Iran? No, there's no link between them. Um, as it relates to the sanctions, uh, as you know, there, were, uh, there was a UN Security Council resolution passed several months ago uh, that allowed for sanctions to be put in place for individuals or entities that prevented um, uh, necessary reforms from happening, uh, the economic reform agenda from achieving effective governance, and that was the finding in this case, the individuals who were named, that they were um, guilty of, uh, of thwarting those efforts. And as happens with member countries, and certainly the United States abides by this, when the UN Security Council puts in place sanctions, the United States as a member country follows suit and puts in place our own sanctions. Um, and that certainly is what happened here. Uh, but we viewed and believed uh, and agreed with the notion that there were efforts to thwart these uh, and active uh, actions, I should say, to thwart um, the implementation of the economic reform agenda, the achieving, a, achieving an effect, effective governance and securing a more uh, representative future for Yemen. And that's why we supported the sanctions. Your Iran question again? It was. Oh, I appreciate this. And this is our mistake, not anyone else's. As often happens with Secretary Kerry, his schedule changes a bit from time to time. I can, I can tell you from traveling with him quite a bit. He's no longer going to the UAE. Um, we will have, um, of course, representatives there. Um, uh, attending the conference. Um, he's going to Amman, and then in terms of other travel, I don't have any update on that quite yet. Is he going to meet with any Iranian uh, Well, he just had a couple days of meetings with Foreign Minister Zarif and Baroness Ashton. So next week, as you know, the political directors will be reconvening in Vienna, and I expect at some time he'll be participating in that, but I don't know at what point in time yet. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Jay. Um, my question is, to what extent does the uh, uh, president summit between President Xi and Obama has helped to assuage uh, both sides' concerns and suspicions? And my second question is, how would you 
correct, uh, characterized the overall relationship between U.S. and China with the insight of its uh, 35 years of historic of um, diplomatic relationship. Well, uh, you know, the president spoke to this quite eloquently, and as did President Xi, in that, um, you know, there are certainly areas where we feel we made progress on, on climate change. I mentioned uh, the CBMs, uh, obviously um, uh, the ITA, an important economic agenda item. Uh, but there are also areas where we continue to disagree. I think both sides felt, as I saw from press reports, but I'd certainly refer to the Chinese to read out their side, uh, that it was a successful meeting, that it was productive, that there was progress made on important issues like climate change. But there are still some issues, uh, certainly issues that we continue to have disagreements on, and we'll raise those uh, through appropriate channels as well. Uh, go ahead. Hello, my name is uh, Raquel Sanz from Barcelona. Hello. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting us here. Um, so regarding Catalonia, as you know, last Sunday we held a referendum, a non-binding referendum about our uh, political future. So I know the State Department's position is that it is, a, it is an internal affair. Uh, so we already know that. Okay. So however, <laughs> however, my question would be, does the US defend the right of nations like Scotland uh, to decide their political future through legal referendums? Well, I think we said in every situation is different, as you know. Our co position continues to be that this is an internal matter uh, for Spain. Uh, if it's a legal referendum, I, I'm sure we will address that if, if that comes to be. But at this point in time, that's uh, hypothetical. Go ahead. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we'll go to you next. I'm sorry okay. about that. Oh. I was a confusing pointing there. Go ahead. Me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So back to Iran. I'm Devika back from the Times of London. Sure. Back to Iran. Um, could you comment on the statement made today by Senators Menendez and Kirk, saying that they're looking to, or intimating at least, that they will increase sanctions on Iran if the deal struck by the administration is not a deal that they consider, or, or, or is a deal that they consider to be weak? Um, are you worried that Congress could scupper these long, drawn-out negotiations? Well, let me first say. No deal is better than a bad deal, and that is the the mantra that the secretary, that Under Secretary Sherman, that all of our negotiators are pursuing these negotiations with. We are not going to agree to a deal that does not have a verifiable mechanism for preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. That does not cut off their paths to a nuclear weapon. Uh, Certainly, uh, we will continue to have a dialogue with members of Congress. That's the beauty of democracy. And we'll continue to brief them on the details of the negotiations as those proceed. But we have, we're about to enter a pivotal uh, 10, 11, 12 days here of the negotiations. And we're encouraging any member to wait to see what, what the final agreement looks like. Because at the end of the day, uh, this is the best opportunity to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. There's not a path. Uh, as it relates to sanctions or any other path that anyone has prevented that's going to be as effective as a comprehensive agreement uh, that will help us monitor and verify uh, that they are doing what they have agreed to do. Oh, go ahead. I promise you in the front. Go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Nikki Kazimov, and I'm with the Echo newspaper in Azerbaijan. And my question is about the earlier incident today uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh. Apparently, there was an Armenian military helicopter that was uh, engaged in military exercises and that was shot uh, by the Azerbaijani side. Do you have any comment on that and specifically on uh, uh, military exercises at the time when there, there are negotiations and uh, when there is a ceasefire that was, you know, very Thank you. Thank you. It certainly is. Uh, we, let me first say we regret the loss of life. Uh, as a result of today's downing of a helicopter along the line of contact. We extend our condolences to the families of those killed or injured. Uh, today's events are yet uh, another reminder of the need to redouble efforts on a peaceful resolution to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, including reducing tensions and respecting the ceasefire. Uh, there can be no military solution to the conflict. Retaliation and further violence will only make it more difficult to bring about a peaceful settlement. Obviously, we've seen these reports. We know there are different comments being made by different sides, but I don't have any uh, verification of, of any of those details. So our focus from here is on just encouraging uh, a redoubling of efforts to achieve a peaceful solution uh, in this conflict. But did it look to you like it was a military 
the exercise? I don't have any work? assessment of that. We've seen the reports. We've seen the comments from both sides, but I'm not uh, going to make an assessment from the United States. Uh, go ahead in the back or right in the middle. Jaffer Jaffery with Al Mahdi, and uh, just a side note: I don't think it's fair that my colleague here comes in after me, but gets to ask a question before I did. Oh no! You should have told me you came in first. We would have <laughs> changed the order. Between the two superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> my question is uh, on Yemen. Mm -hmm. Now, the previous president Ali Abdullah Saleh was uh, a staunch ally of the United States for quite some time. And just recently, the U.S. has listed him on, I'm paraphrasing, on the blacklist. Now, what has really happened? What, what, did, what are the fundamental changes that uh, prompted the U.S. to make this decision? Were there domestic uh, concerns? Were there regional concerns? And if so, what are they? Well, I think, and you raise an important point. Um, you know, Yemen, one, let me say that we continue to want to see Yemen prosper. Uh, we have a, a large uh, embassy presence there, as you know, uh, and it's one where uh, we continue to put a range of resources in. Uh, the UN Security Council uh, resolution or action uh, sanctioned individuals uh, who have uh, using, who has used, ha have, I should say, using violence and other means undermined the political process in Yemen and obstructed the implementation of the political transition outlined by the agreement uh, from three years ago in November. Um, these, the sanctions were put in place as it relates to recent events and recent actions. Uh, yes, we have a long history, but we've seen and been concerned about uh, recent events uh, by the former uh, president, and that's why we supported the sanctions. What, are the, what did he do to make the U.S. Uh, certify that he, he was using violence? Well, I said as it relates to that's what the U.N. Obviously, as you know, there are two were two military commanders who were also sanctioned, uh, but thwarting the efforts towards a transition and preventing that process from uh, moving forward, undermining that. Uh, our concerns that we had about uh, what we were seeing on the ground, and not just the United States. Remember, these were sanctions put in place by the UN Security Council that the United States followed suit with our own sanctions on. Uh, let's go to the way back. Oh, right there. Sorry, you just turned around. Yes, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Lucia Leal with FN News. Uh, I wanted to ask about Mexico. Uh, tensions have been rising uh, in that country about the disappearance of the 43 students and uh, the recent announcement of the government of Mexico that the students had been killed did not uh, convince the parents. Uh, today, the High Commissioner of the UN for Human Rights offered to help resolve the case. Would the U.S. Uh, support an, involve, an involvement of the U.N. to help in the investigation? And are you concerned about the rising tensions in that country? Thanks. Well, um, let me first say, because it's really, the, reading these reports, I don't, I don't know that anybody couldn't be incredibly saddened for uh, not only the victims but their families. Uh, we extend our deep sympathy to family and friends of the victims. This heinous and barbaric crime must be thoroughly and transparently investigated and those responsible be brought to justice without delay and punished consistent with due process and respect for the rule of law. We certainly urge all parties to remain calm through the process. Uh, I understand there have been reports on the ground, of course, of increasing tensions. We've also put out our own um, our own um, messages, emergency messages to United States citizens who are living there and residing there at this point. In terms of whether we would support the UN playing a role, I think that's a discussion for Mexico and the UN to have. Uh, I don't know specifically. I'd have to talk to our team about whether we have a particular position on that uh, involvement. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Inga Czerny, Polish Press Agency. Hello. I'd like, hello. I'd like to come back to Ukrainian cri crisis. So you said that you are um, discussing now possibility of imposing new sanctions on Russia, but are you discussing it within the administration or are you trying to convince the European partners to, to do it together? And, and, and secondly, can we expect any U.S. initiative on this issue during G20 summit? Sure. Well, um, Part of the, the uh, fun of the G20 is the fact that you have all of these leaders of important countries in one place and they have a range of bilateral meetings where they discuss 
a range of issues that are not only in the news but are of global concern, and certainly Ukraine and the situation there and the rising tensions would be one of them. So I certainly expect it would be part of the discussion there and some of the bilateral meetings. Uh, in terms of discussions, we've had an ongoing dialogue with our European partners about um, what to do about the situation in Ukraine. And we and our allies and partners are prepared to broaden and deepen existing sanctions should the situation warrant it. So it's not as if there's a stop and start. There's an ongoing discussion. I don't have anything to preview for you. I don't have any sanctions to announce. I can't predict for you if and when that will happen. Uh, but it's an ongoing discussion, and I can assure you that both the United States and our European partners are prepared to ex deepen and expand uh, if warranted. Uh, go ahead, in the middle. Oh, sorry, ladies first, and then we'll okay. go next to you. Okay. Nice, nice, to, <laughs> nice to see you here. Uh, Mi Gyeong Kim with Seoul Shimbun Daily, South Korea. Um, North Korea recently released the two American detainees. Will it make any difference to influence nuclear negotiation or UN human rights discussion on North Korea? Thank you. Well, thank you for your question. Uh, we are certainly thrilled to have uh, two American citizens back, um, Kenneth Bay and Matthew Miller, uh, who just returned to the United States to their families uh, this weekend. And Kenneth Bay had been detained for two years and Matthew Miller for several months. Um, no, it does not make any difference uh, with our discussions uh, or um, our concerns about um, North Korea's nuclear ambitions, uh, nor does it uh, change our concerns about their human rights record. Uh, in fact, uh, we sent uh, the DNI director Clapper there uh, in part for this reason, because he's somebody who is a cabinet level official uh, with security credentials, but he is not a negotiator on either issue. And we certainly did not want to send the message that we were open to uh, having uh, any discussion or negotiations tied to the release of two American citizens uh, who we felt should have been released uh, some time ago. All right, a couple more. Go ahead. Okay. From KBS, uh, mm -hmm. quick follow-up to your answer. The, uh, as you said, uh, Mr. Cliff uh, visited North Korea, and then also President Obama sent a letter to the North Korean leader Kim Jong Un, did you receive the answer letter from the German Kim Jong Un? And then the one more question: the President Obama discussed uh, discussed with uh, President Park and President Xi Jinping on North Korean nuclear issue. They uh, expressed uh, strong intention to dissolve the North Korean nuclear issue. But what is the next step? And then. What, what is the next uh, strategy to solve the, the, this problem? Uh, well, uh, the letter was a very short and to the point um, couple sentences, I think, is probably the accurate description of it, just describing the fact that DNI Clapper was the president's representative to bring the two American citizens home. Uh, I'm not sure there will be a response to that. Um, obviously, the American citizens have come home, so that certainly is positive news. Um, as it relates to other discussions, uh, we certainly remain in very close touch and obviously at a very high level, uh, including at the presidential level, uh, with uh, members of the six-party talks about our ongoing concerns about rising tensions and rhetoric from North Korea, our concerns about their nuclear ambitions. It doesn't change the fact that the ball remains in North Korea's court. They need to prove to the international community that they're going to abide by their obligations, including the September 2005 statement, and show uh, the international community that they're serious about making changes. We have not seen uh, any indication that they're willing to do that at this point in time. I have not heard of a return letter. I'd, I'd point you to my friends at the White House for that. Go ahead in the back. Hello, my name is Junpei Yoshuko from Japanese Public TV and HK. Yes, hello, uh, I recognize you. Hi. Um, this question was asked by my colleague on Monday probably, but have you talked with the team about the Chinese vessels, dozens, even sometimes more than hundreds, rushing into the Japanese territory or um, economic zone seas, fishing the uh, coral jewelry? Thank you. I, I did uh, talk to our team about this. Um, 
We have seen reports alleging uh, illegal cor coral poaching by Chinese vessels, um, uh, but we have no, really don't have further details of them. I know there have been reports perhaps by your outlet and others. Uh, as a matter of policy, uh, the United States government is committed to ending the deadly and destructive practice of wildlife poaching and trafficking. These illicit activities threaten an increasing variety of terrestrial, freshwater, and marine species, including coral. And in February of 2014, earlier this year, President Obama released a national strategy for combating wildlife trafficking. Uh, we're working, the United States is working to reduce demand, strengthen law enforcement, and collaborate with partners bilaterally and multilaterally to end this pernicious trade. Okay, let's do two more. I saw one in the back. Go ahead. Oh, right here. Yeah, go ahead. Paper. I wanted to ask you about Ukraine as well. What okay. what issues or particular factors would make you extend these sanctions against Russia? I don't know if, for instance, if the crossing of military personnel would be confirmed, if that would be a a factor in the in in the direction to deepen the 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 sanctions. Thank you. Well. Um, Obviously, discussions and negotiations about whether there would be additional sanctions or something that happen internally, and they happen uh, in cooperation with the European Union as we coordinate. Um, in general, um, if uh, Russia's um, if Russia fully implements its commitments, including those it made in, in the Minsk agreement, sanctions can be rolled back, and we certainly would welcome that. Uh, if instead Russian authorities continue their aggressive actions and violations of international law then we and our, our partners would be prepared to broaden and deepen the existing sanctions. So I can't give you a sense, a tick through of if this, then that. I'll just convey that if there continue to be aggressive actions, the discussion and the potential for action will also increase. Uh, I think one more. Go ahead here. Yeah. Maybe oh, one more New York? New York sure. With the last question. Sure. One more here, and then we'll do one from New York. Go ahead. Hi. My name is Anita Kumivesh. I'm from Hungarian newspaper Népszabadság. And uh, there have been uh, disagreements between the U.S. and Hungarian government recently and uh, uh, about corruption. And uh, uh, I was wondering if you could give me an update about whether there have been more steps uh, regarding the visa bans or any steps uh, in this regard. Well, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, we applied Presidential Proclamation 7750 to certain current and former Hungarian officials um, as it relates to uh, concerns about uh, corruption. Uh, I don't think there's a new development that has happened since then, but let me state just since they have the opportunity, um, you know, this is, uh, Hungary is a, a friend uh, an ally of the United States. We have an ongoing dialogue with its government on con questions of democratic principles and addressing corruption. Um, in concert with many European partners, we have conveyed our concerns to the Hungarian government. We've also spoken publicly about developments that harm the health of democratic institutions, civil society, uh, and media freedoms, and we'll continue to have that constructive dialogue. This is a reference to uh, a few uh, individuals that um, were uh, were a few current and former Hungarian officials, I should say, um, who um, we applied uh, our proclamation to. All right, question from New York. Hello, I know you've been waiting. I'm sorry, I've seen you probably need some to stretch or some water. <laughs> Standing a long time, I just forgot my question. No. Oh no! <laughs> so, so, hello, Ms. Saki. Uh, good afternoon, and my good name afternoon. is Kausar Mumin. I'm from Bangladesh. I cover State Department for the last three years for a national daily newspaper named Daily Manab Zamin. So my question today is on United States efforts in promoting democracy and human rights in Asia. But before I start my question, I want to congratulate China and United States uh, on the deal that was struck yesterday. And I want to congratulate Mr. Uh, Mr. President Obama, because as a citizen of Bangladesh, we believe that the climate change deal will benefit the most vulnerable countries like Bangladesh. My question on the today is on especially on United States efforts in promoting democracy in Bangladesh. Uh, I, you have seen the, uh, after the recently concluded U.S.-Bangladesh dialogue, 
there, there was a joint statement, but we haven't seen any emphasize on that statement on Bangladesh democracy. And you know, uh, you didn't, uh, you were upset with the 5 January election. And I understand there is one of the assistant secretary currently visiting in Bangladesh. I just forgot his name. Uh, I want your comment uh, on uh, what are you, there are some reports that United States is no more anymore uh, emphasizing on its value-based diplomacy. So uh, I, I just want your comment on Bangladesh democracy and United States efforts in promoting democracy in Bangladesh. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for your question and for the congratulations, of course. Um, let me first say that the United States is committed to our relationship with Bangladesh uh, as a moderate, secular, Muslim-majority democracy with the seventh largest population and as the third largest Muslim-majority country. Bangladesh's success will have positive, lasting impact in the region and beyond. Uh, the joint statement reflect, reflected our broad relationship with the government and the people of Bangladesh, but our concerns about uh, let's say um, elections uh, that happened last January or concerns about democracy are well known and we state those also frequently. We put out a statement earlier this year around uh, the elections that spoke to um, our uh, views that um, the opposition parties, uh, that the government, we enc encouraging the government of Bangladesh and opposition parties to engage uh, in uh, dialogues to, to, uh, to find a way to hold uh, to allow the people of Bangladesh to have a voice and have one that can be respected. Uh, we've spoken out against fomenting violence. We've spoken out against uh, crackdowns on NGOs and media freedoms. And we certainly do that on a regular uh, basis and will continue to do uh, as we feel warranted. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. This was very fun.